Glad to see everybody here again. This is a pretty big turnout for a, a bonus program in the middle of the month uh, where we don't usually give too many of them. So uh, this is great. Uh, to, to start with, Susan Dyer of the History Center would like to make a short statement. Thank you, everyone. I made a great list and then I left it on my desk. So here's a modified version. Um, on August 1 at 5.30, Jeremy Boshears, who has been out here speaking about his, uh, the covered bridges of Monroe County, is going to be doing a talk at the History Center and a book signing. His new book is out, The, Bridge, or the Covered Bridges of Monroe County. So we hope you can join us for that. That's free. Um, our first guided memory walk is scheduled for this coming Monday, July 22nd at 10 a.m. This uh, tour is designed to engage the senses. It's kind of a shortened version. Um, it'll highlight about eight objects throughout the galleries, and it's a really fun one. It's part of our dementia-friendly programming. It is open to all. You don't have to register, but that would be nice if you could, and you can check our website for that information. Uh, that is www.monroehistory.org. Um, we have a new garage sale site, and the ladies have moved everything over. The new address is 4015 West Profile Parkway. That is near the old, um, it's part of the old GE plant. So they will start accepting donations out there um, on August 7th, that is a Wednesday. And then we have one more event coming up this in two weeks, uh, July 28th, Sunday from 2 to 4. This is a partnership with um, my Leadership Bloomington group called Connect and Cook. And we will be learning all about Chinese dumplings. So this is an intergenerational event. Um, we are going to make the dumplings. Then we are going to learn about the cultural history behind them. And then we get to eat the dumplings. So that's my favorite part. Uh, so <laughs> um, it is free. Uh, but we do need you to register, so you can check our website for that one as well, or you can call the History Center, uh, and it's for, again, everyone, all, all ages uh, are welcome for this. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Susan. We had a couple of things happen just recently, just to bring people up to date. Uh, A.J. Giannopoulos of the History Center got a hold of me and said that they're putting aside a place where we can promote uh, the History Club, which I hadn't even thought of before. So uh, I went down there yesterday and talked to him, and we'll have it up probably by Thursday. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be pretty nice from the posters he showed me that he's made, and we'll have some uh, artifacts supplied by Skip Chambers. So thanks to him and the History Center for that. Also, last week, uh, I and uh, Skip Chambers and Derek Ritchie we were interviewed by uh, Jim Inman Jr. on uh, the radio show, uh, Bloomington Review. And uh, that's WGCL, 1370 AM. So I appreciate all the, the backing that Jim has given us over the years. That's our 13th interview, I think, in six years. I don't know who would keep track but me, but don't worry, we count that kind of stuff. Uh, here's a brief synopsis of our future programs. Uh, in two weeks, July 30th, our own George Carpenter will give one on the Monon. If I can find him, you can tell us about it. Actually, what I can tell you more about it is, is what it's not. This will not be a long-winded, rivet-counting, granular detail of the Monon Railroad. They have some history regarding the beginning of the railroad but I want to concentrate on the way the railroad changed Bloomington and Monroe County and with all the communities that it served in the county. So look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. George, do you want to go ahead and give your usual preamble since you got the mic anyway? No, you got the mic, Mike. <laughs> uh, like, uh, welcome everybody. My wife, Mary Ann Carpenter, is here today. Okay. Yeah. That's enough. I'd <laughs> uh, like to thank the Legion for having us here, as always. Uh, 
Chantel and Sheila have been doing a great job for us today. Please be generous with our servers, otherwise they'll quit serving us. Uh, would also like to thank our friends from CATS for being here as, as always. Uh, looking forward to hearing their presentation next year. There's a lot that CATS does that we don't know about and we want to find out more. Uh, am I forgetting anybody, Mike? Nope. Okay, here you go. It's back to Mike with the mic. All right, thanks, George. My Minister of Propaganda, that's his official title. Oh, also, my wife Paulette's here and my mother Mary. So, uh, and I got a couple of cousins, Bernie and Nat, over there that came in just lately. So glad to see them again. Uh, so the future programs, uh, besides George, is August 27th, John Summerlot will give a program on Indiana University and its military history. Uh, September 24th, that marks the bicentennial month of the First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington, and local historian and author Owen Johnson will present its history. October 15th, another bonus program, because there's five Tuesdays in October. Uh, Brad Cook, who's talked here several times, curator of IU Photo Archives, will return to show more vintage photos of Bloomington. Uh, October 29th, uh, Randy Richardson will give a program entitled Once Upon a Time in Monroe County, Stories from Our Past. Uh, she does blogs for the History Center, which are really interesting to read. Uh, her earliest story here is from 1857, and the latest is about a business that began in 1920 and still going strong. She said there'll be something uh, for the interest of everyone. November 26th, uh, frequent contributor Derek Ritchie will be back. Uh, he changed this just last week when we were down at the radio show. <laughs> he was going to do one thing, but he, he, he's, got, he's got another book he's writing, so it has to do with that. It's called The Dark Side of Monroe County. The mysteries, murders, and scandals that shocked Bloomington. Uh, Derek will relate six different shocking things. He likes this stuff. That happened in Bloomington prior to World War II, Monroe County, that stunned the community. And he went over some of it with me, and it, it, it'll be pretty interesting. Uh, on December 17th, we, we changed that date a little bit because our usual date would be the 31st. That's New Year's Eve. That's probably not good. And then even worse, the week before that's the 24th. That's not good. So we changed it to the 17th. And Hillary Fleck, who's here today, will give another one. This one on women's suffrage, suffrage movement in Monroe County. 2020 will mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Indiana ratified the amendment January 26, 1920. Uh, January 28th, local historian David Nord will give a program entitled Power, Transport, Machinery, the Revolution in Flour Milling in Indiana, including Monroe County from 1820 to 1920. Uh, February and March are still open, but I expect to get those filled soon. April 28th, as uh, George mentioned, Michael White and uh, Adam Stilwell from Catch TV will give a presentation on the origins and history of local Catch TV, who records and televises all our programs. So that leads us to today. The title of this program is Peter Matthews Civil War Diary and the 19th Indiana Infantry. The presenters are Hillary Fleck, collection manager at the Monroe County History Center, and Steve Rolfe, newsletter editor for the Monroe County Civil War Roundtable. And this is his third time here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> presentation will in introduce the audience to Peter and follow his war service through his diary entries. Hillary and Steve will provide maps, corroborate facts and events in the diary, and briefly summarize the service of the 19th century infantry after Peter's discharge. This presentation coincides with the ending of the Joint, a joint History Center and WFIU-WTIU project, which posted Peter's uh, diary entries on the day he wrote them. So, here we go with Hillary. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Okay. I think we can do that. 
Okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this presentation. Thank you to the History Club for allowing us to talk about the diary and um, the Legion for hosting and then Cats for filming. So thank you all very much. Um, we're very excited to talk about this diary. So um, I decided to bring it along. It's very small. Um, Peter uh, was only in the war for a year, which we will talk about, but this is the size of his diary, very thin. Um, and I thought I would just show his writing is even smaller. Um, so I have some excerpts um, that I put on the screen, but I don't know if you'll be able to read them. They're so small, but I'm going to try. So today, Steve and I are going to talk about uh, Peter Matthews, his, specifically his diary that he kept during the war service, and then um, Steve will also be giving context for the entries and um, talking about the 19th Infantry. Um, okay. Oops, I forgot this thing. <clears throat> so this presentation is uh, signifying the end of a project that WTIU, WFIU, um, and the History Center were having together of posting the entries of Peter Matthews's uh, oh, the lights. Um, diary as on the day that they happened. So it started uh, last year in August, and then it just ended yesterday. His last entry of his diary is July 15th, 1862. So it ended yesterday. So that's very exciting. Um, so the this is the um, an image from the website. So this is what it looks like. Is this. Um, Civil War Diary entries, and you can see them online. Um, and WTIU, WFIU is hosting this page, so I don't know how long it's going to be there. Um, but if you're interested in reading the diary entries, you can go to this website, or uh, you can always stop by the History Center, and we have a transcript. Um, so you can always read every entry if you like. Um, but I'm only going to pick the highlights. So, um, And then I also want to do a real quick about Peter Matthews, because I know Clay Stuckey is in the audience, and he's the expert on the Matthews family. But uh, Peter, was, this is a, an image of Peter. Um, he was born in England in 1840 to John and Mary Ann. They, John is the one who started the Matthews um, Stone Company and all of that jazz over in Ellettsville. Um, so Peter acknowledges in his very first entry, which we'll get to, um, that he worked with his father in the stone quarry in order to help support the large family that John had. Um, and in 1861, Peter hears that men from Bloomington and Gosport are enlisting, and he decides to do so as well, perhaps also to help support the family. Um, he was a member in the band, and they paid, I think it was $15 a month. Something like that. So, you know, nice amount. Um, okay, so this is you. Okay. Tag team. Tag team. My turn. Okay. Um, yeah, as, as Hillary said, I'm here to give Civil War context to this because she's the Peter Matthews expert. Um, and I think what I want to start with is to talk about how units were uh, formed and how they got into the Army in the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the United States Army amounted to about 16,000 men total, nationwide, everything. By the time the Civil War ended, over 2.1 or 2.2 million men had served. So clearly, this was mostly a citizen soldier kind of a thing. And today, if you were to join the, if I were to join the army, and they wouldn't want me, you'd you'd join up, you'd go to a processing center, and you'd take a bunch of tests, and then you'd go to another center, and you'd end up with a bunch of people from all over the country. Uh, in the Civil War, that didn't happen. These guys went to war. Um, most of the time as a unit. And what happened with the, uh, with the 19th Indiana, which Peter's band was in, was they were people that, first of all, played together before there was a military situation going on um, in the county. And then the war started, well, the, the secession crisis started in the winter of uh, 1860. Uh, especially when South Carolina uh, seceded in December of 1860, and people could tell that uh, war might be coming. So local militia units started practicing together on weekends, and eventually Peter joined one of these. Uh, I think it was on Saturday mornings he went and, and practiced 
with his group, and then they were uh, pulled together, and they were sent. Now, he, the, he ended up going with the 19th Indiana, which very quickly, and I'll get more into this at the end of the presentation, too. The 19th Indiana ended up becoming part of the Iron Brigade. The Iron Brigade was a group of a brigade of soldiers that was made up of units from the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin, the 19th Indiana, and then a little later, but not much later, the 24th Michigan. And they were a very vaunted and, and honored group uh, by the time the war was over, especially by the time the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 was over. And as I say, I'll talk a little bit more about, it, about that at the end, because Peter was gone by that time. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, too. But Peter was not part of the 19th uh, by the time they really gained their greatest fame. Um, they got their name because a couple of generals said, well, you know what? General George McClellan, one of our favorite Civil War generals, at least to, to talk bad about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there are all kinds of reasons why that. But anyhow, after the battles of South Mountain and Antietam, McClellan was talking to General Hooker, and, and McClellan says, what men are these fighting on the pike? And uh, Hooker says, General Gibbon's brigade of Western men. Uh, that said, and McClellan says, they must be made of iron. Hooker says, by the eternal, they are iron. If you had seen them at Bull Run as I did, you would know them to be, in, to be iron. And then McClellan says, why, General Hooker, they fight equal to the best things in the world. Um, that might be slightly apocryphal, but there are reasons why it might not be, too. Nobody's ever been able to prove it one way or the other. Um, okay. I think we're up to you. That's you again. Okay, so this is his first entry on August 24th, 1861, and it was about a month after he enlisted officially in the 19th Indiana. So his official enlistment date was July 29th, and so this is August 24th, so it's a little bit later. Um, and you can see from this slide of the top half of one page um, is that his handwriting is very, very small, It's all, and as is most historic handwriting at this time, but... Uh, for the presentation, I'm going to underline the parts that I'm going to read. So hopefully you can sort of follow along, but it's also quite hard. Um, so uh, in this entry, Peter describes why he decided to keep a diary and why the United States are at war, which is something that I recommend everybody who starts a diary is to state very clearly why you're keeping a diary. A historian is going to love you for it. Um, and it's so very nice to just be like, oh, well, thank you, Peter. Thank you for elaborating on that. Um, so the first sentence is, I have thought over the matter plenty of times for it surely and have come to the conclusion that I would never regret having spent a few moments each day in writing a kind of autobiography. Um, the next sentence, I will be pleasant surely in old age if I if I please divine providence to spare me, to refer to this little book to see how I spent my time while young. So that's why he's keeping a diary. So that's very fun. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and then the next entry. Last fall, the people of the United States saw fit to ele elect Abe Lincoln over Stephen A. Douglas, John Bell, and John C. Breckinridge for their president and for which the southern part of them decide, deemed it their duty to declare themselves out of the Union. Um, so this was why we're at war. Um, and, then it's, and then he goes on in the entry to des describe how he got into the war. Um, so it says, during this, that time, there was a company's making up in Gosport and Bloomington for the three-month service, and a few of the boys from our neighborhood were enlisting. We started a company of home guards in which I joined and drilled half a day every Saturday, which I could not well spare at this time by degrees. And then he goes on to say, I told my mother of my intention to enlist, and she tried to. <laughs> tried to what? I don't know. That's where it ends. It's the very last line. She tried to something. I can only imagine what she tried to do. Um, but <laughs> I was going to say that maybe she just wasn't very happy that he tried to enlist. I don't know. But he does not elaborate. Uh, his very next entry is a, a month later in September. So we really, really don't know what she tried to do. But next we've got Matt. Uh, Matt. 
this will show where Peter was serving, or at least where he got to in the end. Um, and it's, it's interesting because uh, you, you never quit learning things. This morning I was reading a bit out of Peter Nolan's, or Peter Nolan, um, Alan Nolan's <laughs> book, The Iron Brigade, which if you ever want to read a good book about the Iron Brigade, it's excellent. Uh, Alan Nolan was an attorney in Indianapolis and, and wrote this book many years ago, but it's an excellent um, biography or history of the Iron Brigade. But anyhow, I found a paragraph in there that said that the band members, it's the only thing I could find about the band, the band members, well, the, the, the unit was formed on the 29th of July, and the 19th left for Washington about a week later. But I found out this morning that the band didn't leave a week later with their unit because the uniforms they were given were not... They were, they were considered not to be worthy of band members, so they waited around to get uniforms. So they didn't leave until later, which is probably why his diary doesn't start until later. So a little bit of history that I just learned this morning. Um, but anyhow, this is where Peter was. His unit finally ended up getting to um, you know, where he first got to was Fort Marcy which actually was Fort Smith at the time, and it was changed to Fort Marcy later. You can see there's another Fort Smith. I don't know if it's because there were multiple Smiths or whether Mr. Smith didn't like that location, but for some reason uh, that was moved, and he went to Fort Marcy and then to uh, Fort Ethan Allen right here, and then eventually ended up both at Fort Craig, which I, my glasses, my bifocals won't show, but Fort Craig is down around here, um, and then right in there, and then he ended up spending some time in the winter months actually uh, bivouacking in Washington itself. Uh, the, you'll, if you read the diary, he went back and forth across the Long Bridge from the Virginia side to the other side many, many times uh, to serenade. This is what the band did. They serenaded generals. They played for uh, events and this kind of thing, and, that's, and they did a lot of it. They did really a lot of it, and they were always, at least according to Peter, were well praised for their work, and a couple of times they were given uh, special meals after their performances and even uh, some liquid libation after their performances. Um, let's see. Where are we here now? Okay. This next piece here, which I will read you as Hillary did, I'll read you the, the uh, highlighted area. Uh, he has an entry on his diary on October the 22nd, and he and it says, General King's aide came riding up reporting a fight at Edwards Ferry up the Potomac in which General Baker of the California Regiment, it says Cal, but it was the California Regiment, was killed. Um, this is a very interesting, it caught my eye immediately, it wouldn't mean a thing to a lot of people, but General Edward Baker was, and as far as I know, still is, the only sitting United States Senator to be killed in battle. He was a United States Senator at this time. Um, and he was killed, and actually the Battle of Edwards Ferry is really more commonly known as the Battle of Balls Bluff. Uh, Balls Bluff was, the, the, most Civil War battles have at least two names and sometimes three, uh, but it was the Battle of Balls Bluff. And basically, um, let's see, I think we have a picture here. This is, Gen uh, well, General or Senator Baker, however you want to refer to him. And this is the moment of his demise. He was shot twice, uh, almost simultaneously, once in the head and once in the chest, and I probably was dead before he hit the ground. He was a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln's. Um, he uh, knew Lincoln from the Illinois days. He had moved to the West Coast, uh, to the <coughs> excuse me, to the California and the Oregon area. And in fact, if you'll remember, uh, Abraham Lincoln's first son's name was Edward. He's named after this man right here. Uh, it's interesting because Lincoln also had, now this is a real quick thing, Lincoln also had one more personal friend, uh, Elmer Ellsworth, who was killed at the Marshall House in Alexandria, Virginia, very early in the war, um, and he was a personal friend. He, was, uh, he had a zoology unit, and he went down, and he, he saw a flag on top of the Marshall House, which was a hotel in Alexandria, and he ran up to take it down, and the proprietor, a man named Peter Jackson, shot him, and Ellsworth's men shot Jackson, so they both died at that moment. But and, and Ellsworth was laid out in the White House. That's how close a friend. So Lincoln lost two very close friends very, very early in the war. Um, okay. I think that is, yeah. Okay. 
Yep. Uh, so this entry is from October 4th, um, and it's this is just an interesting one. Um, and this was, this afternoon witnessed the ascent of Professor Lowe in his balloon. The balloon is a very large one, 40 feet through, and with the aid of this and a good glass, he then communicated much valuable information. He went up without ropes this evening and floated to the east out of sight. So he would have, at the end there, he would have floated back into Washington City. But um, this is another interesting um, part of the Civil War that I don't think many people know about. There was the very first aerial troop crew, I guess. So um, the Union Army had a balloon corps, and they had about seven balloons, um, all uh, commanded by Professor Lowe um, and his assistants for the balloon corps. And uh, the balloon corps didn't last very long, though. Um, it was quite difficult to get hydrogen gas, which is what they were filled with, hydrogen to a battlefield, um, even though he did figure it out with wagons, as you can see um, in the picture. But it was still a little bit of expensive. Um, the intelligence that the balloonists brought back to the field was often typically ignored or mishandled, so it didn't go well. Um, and then in about 1863, the government was looking at the financial costs of the war at this point. It was dragging on longer than they had anticipated, and the balloon corps was really scrutinized about how much it was costing and, and what, what was the benefit of having it, so Professor Lowe just quit. And then the, uh, the balloon corps was then disbanded. So, but it's fun to say that Peter saw Professor Lowe. Um, okay. The next entry is November 20th. Um, at this point, he has uh, the grand review of the Army of the Potomac. So he is participating in this. And this is one of the biggest reviews of the Army at this time um, in 1861. And so he says at and underlined here is at least 75,000 troops and 25,000 spectators were there about noon, uh, General McClellan accompanied by Abraham Lincoln and a host of officers and foreigners rode past in review. Um, later on in the same entry is, it was sundown as we moved by the president and he seemed very much pleased by our appearance. So. I was looking into this and I was like, sundown before you got to the president. And that was a really long, that's, that's a long time at this point. And um, from newspaper articles, I read that the review started at about 2 p.m. Um, and I was like, well, that's, that seems like a really long time. But, uh, this is an image from Harper's Weekly, which was a weekly magazine um, for the United States at that time. And you can see just how many people, how many troops are in this Army of the Potomac. It's really hard when you just see, hear the number of 75,000 troops and when you can see that many troops. And then, then it makes sense that it would take hours upon hours for troops to, to march past um, the stand that the president would have been in. Um, so this is really a big, a big event, 25,000 spectators. Uh, another newspaper article had claimed that um, half of Washington seemed to all be across the river uh, viewing the Army of the Potomac. So it was really a big deal at the time. And Peter was part of the band um, for the, the uh, 19th at the time. So, okay. Are we up to mission? Yes. Yes, we are. What we have here is one of arguably my five favorite photographs from the Civil War. I just think this thing has so much stuff in it for, uh, for what it is. But what I want to talk about here is Lincoln's relationship with George McClellan. And if you know anything about the Civil War, George McClellan was sort of a doofus. Uh, he was actually, uh, and if you think about this, I said earlier that the Army was very small. Um, they needed officers, and they needed general officers badly. And McClellan had had some success in Ohio and in, in Western Virginia, which is today West Virginia, and in Western Virginia early in the war. And so he was basically hired to form and run the Army. And he was an excellent organizer, an excellent trainer. His men loved him, but he had one problem. And that was he would believe anything that Alan Pinkerton would tell him in terms of battle numbers. And if Alan Pinkerton told him there were 15,000 people facing him, he'd double it to 30, and Allen had probably already doubled it himself. So Lincoln was, or excuse me, McClellan was constantly asking for support troops. 
um, from the president, and the president got very frustrated because he, he, McClellan did not want to move. He simply wanted to get more troops and train and get more troops, and there's all kinds of quotes that say this, that, that, that talk about this. Uh, but Lincoln basically said that McClellan had a case of the slows. He just didn't want to move. Uh, that was his quote. Um, and I like this picture because, and I think, and I don't know that there's any way to prove this, but if you can see this, whoop, excuse me, I hit the wrong button. Uh, this is McClellan right here. McClellan was called, I just heard it up here, Little Mac. Uh, the, the, he was the Napoleon of our army, but anyhow. And of course, this is Lincoln. And I am convinced that when Lincoln had this picture taken, he made sure he had his stovepipe hat on because he wanted to tower over George McClellan. Um, and, and indeed, he did. And this was on, uh, this picture was, photo was taken on October the 3rd, 1862, by Alexander Gardner. Uh, and uh, in November of 1862, Lincoln finally had had enough with George McClellan and fired him. Uh, for the last time, and that, that was Lincoln's problem. He he kept looking for a good general, and he finally found one when he got to a guy named Grant. Uh, a little later, he found a general who would, as he said, fight. He said, he, "Yeah, the the old saying, you know, well, Grant's a, a drunkard. He drinks all the time." And Lincoln said, "Well, whatever he's drinking, get a barrel for all of my generals because he fights." Um, but the other th reason that I love this photo, and this is just a real quick thing, is because of this man right here. That is George Armstrong Custer, who would go on to later fame about 14 years later uh, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Not very long fame, but he gained his fame at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But he was a captain at the time. He was an aide to George McClellan, and he was there. Of course, he quickly in the Civil War gained Brigadier General Brevet status and was involved. Uh, for instance, the most famous thing is the cavalry charge, uh, the cavalry defense on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. Um, OK. There is a list of them. If you want to come up, there are most of them are there. I think General McClernand's in there. There's some other people. But I've got a list. Uh, I've got a book up here that has a list of them on it. But um, OK, now we're going to get to the show and tell time. Uh, lying here on the table, and you can see it. I'm going to walk over away from the mic for just a second and hold it up. And I should tell you, first of all, it's a replica. This is not a real deal thing. In fact, it's brand new. I say brand new, just a few years old. It was made in Italy. But it's a replica of the Springfield rifle from the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts, um, which also there were some of them made theoretically at Harper's Ferry. I, I, I wasn't really sure if that was the case. I read that in one source, but ma mainly the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. This was the killing machine of the day. Um, and the reason that I wanted to talk about this is because you can see, let me go here. This, and we actually printed this one out for you because it's so small. Peter made an entry in his diary about this. Well, Peter wasn't a, a fighting man soldier. He was in the band. This is the only entry he made that day. So clearly, this was a big deal to Peter and a big deal to his unit. They were supplied with these rifles. And that meant that they were really going to be able to, to fight. I have here also... <laughs> Another, another show and tell. Many of you have probably seen Mini Balls in the past, which is a funny name because it's not very small. It's a huge chunk of lead, and it's not a ball. But anyway, it's a mini ball. It's named after it was invented by a man named Minier, a Frenchman named Minier. And these are actual, and, and I'm going to tell you this, and, and, and I'm going to use that gun if I don't get these back, but I'm going to pass them around the room. <laughs> these are actual mini balls taken off the field of Cold Harbor, um, by my wife's grandfather, C.A. Eberly, uh, when he was there visiting his friend who happened to be the superintendent of Cold Harbor, and they went on the battlefield and picked him up. Patently illegal today. You couldn't do this. But the superintendent just, hey, here. Yeah, and so they have come down to me because I'm the only geek in the family that's a Civil War nut now. But I'm just going to pass them around because I want you to feel these.
<laughs> well, I, I think the thing to remember is, and I was talking to somebody about the, this before, that there were so many injuries that were so bad, there were lots of amputations. Well, because this thing would hit a bone and it just shatter it. There was no way to fix it, especially, especially in the middle of the 19th century. So you cut it off and throw it away. And uh, anyhow, I'll pass that around, and I think I'm on to you. Okay, so the next few entries are pretty close together. Um, I thought to, I would hi uh, highlight Christmas Day. So this is uh, Wednesday, December 25th, 1861, and the large text at the top says, Christmas Day in former days, what charms is the name? Um, this entry is rather long. As you can see, I have a page here, and then it goes on to a second page. So it's a pretty long entry, um, and it's not too happy. I mean, he's, he's sad that he's not with his family, and, um, you know, he's stuck in the middle of a war. So he goes on, and he's, he's a little bit sad. He, it does cheer up towards the end where um, they're all singing together as part of the band that he's, um, they're playing uh, festive music and that sort of thing. Um, so he does cheer up, and it, the underlined um, bit does say, quite a pleasant Christmas after all. So it's not so bad, um, but he does uh, go on for a bit saying that he's, he's sad that he's not with his family. And that kind of goes into our next entry, which is December 31st, so the last day of the year. He, again, gets philosophical and, and misses, misses his family. And uh, <clears throat> The red highlight is, uh, "'Tis the last day of the year, and what a year it has been. It has witnessed many joyful and many sad events, but it has brought us no peace to this war which it introduced. An unlucky, bad, portentous year, I'd call it." Uh, then he goes on a bit about um, some of the other guys in the band. Then it says in the in the blue pit there, it says, We sat up late chatting till late in the in the best of spirits till the year one thousand eight hundred and sixty one was no more, and the new year began its course. Wish, wishing each other a happy new year, we rolled up in our blankets, laid down on terra firma, and joined to dreamland. Then he ends it with thinking of home. So I thought that was really cute. It's like he's still thinking of home and missing his family. Um, in this, you know, time when most families uh, spend a lot of time together is over Christmas and New Year's. Um, so then we have New Year's Day, January 1st, 1862. Um, he mentions uh, in the first entry, I witnessed an eclipse of the sun with my naked eye this morning at sunrise. The eclipse was partial, but only, but larger than any I ever saw before. Uh, so you can actually look this up on NASA's website, that you can look up the positions of the planets and all that stuff on any day of, of whatever history you want to look it up. And he did witness a partial eclipse, um, but NASA has it as um, December 31st, 1861. So this is actually the day, the, the evening before he witnesses this partial eclipse. So why he put it on the day, the next day at sunrise, I'm not really sure, um, but that's just, um, that's just interesting, but he does witness an eclipse, and, and so that's pretty, pretty cool, and he mentions it in his diary. Um, the next entry is very, very short, February 19th, more rain, rain, rain. Um, this is a common theme throughout the diary, is he's talking about the weather and how bad it is, and so it really just makes you... I mean, you know, we've had a lot of rain, but this is, I mean, in 1861 to 1862, there's so much rain that he talks about, and how his tent's getting flooded out, how they, they had to march in wet clothes for about two days before there was a nice day where their clothes would actually dry. Um, so it's really, it's, I feel him. I feel for this entry, you know, I get it. We're sick of the rain at this point, but yeah, that's the only thing he wrote in his diary that day was rain. So I can I can feel that morale bummer. Um, oh, and then you're next. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, to tie Peter back to what was going on in the Civil War at the time, um, I had mentioned earlier that that uh, the 19th when Peter was in it was early in the war. 
And I also talked about the lack of generals who could lead in the Civil War. Well, what happened in February of 1862 was the Battle of Forts, actually it's Forts Henry and Fort Donelson, but Fort Henry fell rather quickly. And you can go visit it today. It's under 40 feet of water in the land between the lakes. But um, anyhow, Fort Donelson was reported back to their groups and uh, said, official news come this evening that Fort Donelson had surrendered with 15,000 prisoners, 20,000 something illegible of arms, garrison, equipage, and two General Buckner and Johnston of Bull Run notoriety. Well, General Buckner is the most interesting general that's mentioned. This is Simon Bolivar Buckner, who was a West Point friend of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's. Grant was the commander of the Union forces at Fort Donelson. Fort Donelson, by the way, is in north, it's right on the border between Tennessee and Kentucky, or close to the border between Tennessee and Kentucky, two-thirds of the way to the west of the side of the state. Um, but Buckner was a personal friend, and he thought he could get pretty nice surrender terms from his old buddy Grant. Well, this is where the Grant, whose name was Ulysses Simpson Grant, U.S. Grant, got also the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant because he looked at his old friend and there are no terms I will give you. This is, has to be Unconditional Surrender. Um, so that is where that came from. Uh, yeah, all the forts near here fired salutes. When the news came in the evening, General King sent over the field officers and the band to go to his quarters to help them rejoice because this was a big deal. There are a lot of people today, me among them, that think that the Western theater was the, the, the theater that won the Civil War. Now, if you're not familiar with the two theaters of the Civil War, the Eastern theater was basically Virginia. The Western theater was everything else. <laughs> Uh, and that's that's the way it worked. And they eventually won the West, and then the Western Theater Army started moving over to the East, and that's uh, I, I could go on for hours about that. Um, but the thing that is interesting about this entry in his diary is another interesti uh, another entry that is not there and puzzles me, and I'll, we'll never know. But the next major battle in the Civil War was the Battle of Shiloh, which was fought on April 6th and April the 7th. Uh, of 1862, and there's no mention of it. And it was a much bigger battle and a much bigger deal, and it was, again, a victory by U.S. Grant, uh, almost a defeat, but he hung in there, and on the second day he was able to pull it out. But I don't have any idea why wouldn't they be talking about the, the, the victory at Shiloh, but they didn't. This entry is Wednesday, April 2nd, and um, this is an interesting entry to highlight that the band was not only just musicians playing music, so they also helped out in other ways, um, and this highlights it. So this entry says, uh, um, today there was a litter drill for the musicians, and then underlined it says, they showed, this is talking about the surgeons, it says, they showed us how to put on bandages on how to stop the flow of blood in all parts of the body, and how to carry them on stretchers, et cetera, et cetera, had a good drill. So this is um, just an interesting note that um, the bands often helped with medical duties. They would set up uh, medical tents before battle. Uh, they would help gather wood to build stretchers, to make splints, that sort of thing, ahead of the battle. And then after the battle, they would also help carry the wounded back to the medical tents and that sort of thing. So. Uh, they also participated. This is a photograph of the Army of the Potomac and ambulance drill. So this is the exact sort of thing that Peter is talking about, except this is later on after Peter is discharged. So he's not in the photo. But um, it's a nice example of that the bands didn't just play music and um, didn't just you know, play at guard mount or anything like that. They also helped with medical, um, medical duties uh, in the middle of battle. So, um, and then it's you again. Okay, um, on this entry, Peter's talk said, began marching at 9 a.m., went in sight of where the hardest fight was of the Battle of Bull's Run, crossed the railroad that brought in Johnson's reinforcements, which turned the day against us past Beauregard's headquarters. Okay, he's talking about the Battle of Bull Run. Now, 
he was not there. It's interesting, Peter's term of service. There were two battles of Bull Run, first of all. The first one was on July the 21st, 1861. Peter wasn't there yet. The second one was the end of August, towards the end of August of 1862. Peter was already gone. So Peter had not, did not have anything himself directly to do with these battles. But here he was stationed at a place where he could see the battlefield. And he talks about there being hundreds of horses on the battlefield. Well, he's not talking about live horses. He's talking about horses that had been there for some time, bones. Um, and it was the, 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 the first battle of Bull Run was a Union defeat that caused his, his commander during the time he was in Washington, Irvin McDowell, to be demoted from the commander of the army down to being basically a commander for the protection of Washington, D.C. Um, and then the second battle of Bull Run, McDowell was also interestingly involved in that. He wasn't the, the army commander, but, he, but they lost that one too, folks. Uh, we did not do very well in the Eastern Theater early in the war. Um, but uh, this, this is a way that, that Peter uh, actually got to see some of the... Say, and you can go back and you can look at the same things today. I think they have taken the horses out, though. <laughs> okay, so the next few entries are uh, a general interest entries. Um, so this is Wednesday of April. I didn't have it on. Yes, so this is Wednesday, April 30th, and he, the underlined bit says, we came across a table gravestone bearing the following inscription, um, which I'll get to in a moment, but it's, here lies interred the body of Edward Edmund Helder. So I was like, well, that's interesting. We have a, a database nowadays called findagrave.com, and you can find where people are buried. And so Edmund Helder shows up. So uh, Edmund Helder is indeed buried uh, uh, near in Stafford County, Virginia, you can see, and it says the tombstone is gone now. Um, it says that the entry says that uh, it's no longer at this location, but in 1862, a soldier came, came across it and wrote down the inscription. So it'll, it would have been the same sort of deal that Peter uh, wrote down, but it says, here lies interred the body of Edmund Helder, practitioner in physics and cryergy, born in Bedfordshire, um, obit... March 11th, 1618, or maybe 1676 or 1678, because the ones and the sevens kind of look the same, so nobody's really sure which one it was, um, but he was 76 years old. So um, he thinks that this is a quite an interesting uh, little relic that he says, so uh, it was an interesting thing for him to stumble across, and he writes the whole thing down, so it's really fascinating. Um, but you can find it on findagrave.com. Uh, following in that vein, so this is a full page, so I don't expect anybody to be able to read this, but um, later the next month, on Thursday, May 22nd, um, he talks about seeing Mary, the mother of Washington, her grave. So this is just outside of Fredericksburg, or is it in Fredericksburg? It's in town. In town, in town in Fredericksburg. Well, at this time, though, it's outside of town, right? Well, probably. It was on yeah. Um, so the underlined bit says, uh, we visited the tomb and monument of Mary, the mother of Washington. The cornerstone of the monument was laid by Jackson in 1829, 30 years ago. It is not finished yet. The spire lies on the ground close to the base in the rough with not a mark of a chisel on it. It is shocking to see how shameful it has been treated by the sacrilegious rebels who are not content to write their names all over it and to the shame of our own have done some of the same. Uh, but they have fired gunshots and bullets in one place in front of the, the charge of a canister into it. Um, so they're basically taking shots at it and using it for target practice. Um, this harshest treatment is ascribed to the illegible, uh, can't read that word, but comment on, the, on such conduct, conduct is unnecessary. It speaks for itself. How such men engaged in such causes as theirs can, can succeed, I can't contrive. So he's very mad that uh, this monument is uh, being graffitied and uh, damaged by it. And so this is a picture from 1865. Um, so you can see that the obelisk part of the of the monument is on is laying on the ground. Oops, what did I do? Um, it is lying on the ground. I'm not sure what I did. I hit that button. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> 
So the obelisk is lying on the ground here, and you've got a, a soldier. This is 1865, so he's just guarding the monument. Um, and then this is what it looks like today. So it's quite different. So I'm, I'm sure that at some point they like took it down and rebuilt it up again. Um, but that's what it looks like today and um, is in the middle of a residential neighborhood now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So next is in July. Um, so this is the end, towards the end of his service. It's coming to a close. Uh, Friday, July 11th, he says, um, the underlined part is, uh, the whole camp in an uproar yesterday, Congress passed a bill discharging all regimental bands, retaining b brigade bands. Uh, the regimental band is to be discharged within 30 days after the bill becomes law. I don't know what will happen now. The regiment through most, uh, most all of the boys said they'd hire us and pay us better than the government. Um, but time, he says, time will solve it there at the end. Um, but it didn't. Um, he was still let go. Uh, so this is part of the, the bill that he's referencing. So you can see section five, um, this top right about here. And the men composing such bands shall be mustered out of service within 30 days of the passage of this act, which passed on July 17th. So within a month, he is out of the band. Um, down here further, it says that you can have each brigade band can have 16 men in the service. So who those men, they, maybe they were from the various regiments, but only 16 were allowed to be in the brigade band. So he didn't make the cut. Um, and he was discharged. So we have, this is from the Indiana um, Civil War records that Peter Matthews uh, was discharged on August 9th, 1862. Um, so we don't, his final entry, like I said earlier, was July 15th. Um, it's a very normal entry. It doesn't mention anything about the impending doom of like, I'm going back home and whatever. It doesn't say anything about that. It's more about like we mustered or you know, we had guard mount today and the weather was bad, you know, just like a lot of his other entries. Um, and then it just stops. So we don't, he didn't continue. He didn't write a very nice, uh, I'm home now, um, sort of entry, uh, which would have been really wonderful. But uh, the, this is all that we have of when he was discharged. Um, I was able to come across this uh, newspaper advertisement um, from an Indianapolis newspaper called the Daily Sentinel, um, July 26th. So this is about two weeks after his last entry. Um, and it says, the band of the 19th U.S. Infantry will give a complimentary concert to the ladies and gentlemen of Indianapolis this Saturday evening. Um, so we can, uh, Steve and I have kind of pieced together that it's likely that he was discharged. Um, he was sent back uh, to Indianapolis to wait out his official discharge, which happened about 10 days later. And um, while he was there, while they were all there, what's a band to do but give a concert? So uh, that's what they're good at. So um, they decided to give a concert for um, the men and women of Indianapolis at that time. Um, after he... Uh, was discharged. He went back to Ellettsville, back to working with his father and then eventually his brother um, in the quarry. And he married Emma, Sarah Emma Stinson in 1867. They had four children. All of them survived to adulthood. So that was really wonderful. Nice little family life. But unfortunately, um, on April 29th, 1884, when he's just 44 years old, he dies in an explosion. Um, so that's unfortunate, uh, but on April 29th, an outbuilding at the Matthews Quarry caught fire and Peter rushed over to help put the fire out. Unfortunately, there were several cartridges inside the building and they, ex like dynamite cartridges, and they exploded. Uh, they killed one man, oops, sorry. They killed one man instantly um, and injured 13 others and Peter was one of, ah, and Peter was one of the 13 that was injured. He was um, one of the most gravely injured people. He was hit several times in the chest and once in the leg with shrapnel from the explosion. And um, he passed away later that evening on um, April 29th. But he was surrounded by his family, so that's nice. Um, 
So his funeral, it lists uh, later in newspaper articles, lists that his funeral was attended by everyone in Ellisville. And the entire town shut down. And um, never before, uh, this is from... Um, this is from the local paper. Never before had any locality in Monroe County so been so terribly stricken, so completely overwhelmed with sorrow and despair. So um, it also mentions that his, he was a member of the GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic for Veterans. Um, and uh, many members of the GAR from Ellettsville, Monroe County, and around the state came to his funeral to honor him. So that was really nice. But um, Okay, now Steve's going to talk. We're almost done. Yep. By the way, one of the things that I wanted to say to follow up on some of the stuff that both Hillary and I have been talking about is that you see some of the entries in his diary that he's sort of almost like a starry-eyed tourist. And I like to point out to people, most of these men that went to war had probably never been more than 20 or 30 miles from their home in their entire lives. So they were suddenly put on trains, they were taken to places, and this was an absolute fascination. If any of you were here when I gave my talk on Frank Fee, who's buried over here in Rose Hill Cemetery, he was impressed with the magnificent size of the State House in Nashville, Tennessee, which is dwarfed by tall office buildings now, uh, and really isn't that magnificent a building, in my opinion, anyway. But, but this is the kind of thing that these soldiers saw. Okay. Um, the 19th Indiana, as part of the Iron Brigade, went on after Peter left for uh, really the duration of the war. Um, and what I want to give you is just a little, if Peter had hung around, what he would have been involved in and why the 19th is still considered one of the most honored regiments in the Civil War today. Uh, the next serious engagement that they were in very shortly after Peter left was at Antietam. If you know anything about the Battle of Antietam, the first day, the, excuse me, the, it was a one-day battle. It was, by the way, the bloodiest day in the history of American warfare period to this day. Over 21,000 casualties. Now, casualties are dead, wounded, missing, and captured. Uh, but a lot of people were killed that day. Uh, the 19th Indiana was involved in the early morning charge on the cornfield on the north side of the Battle of Antietam. Uh, the 27th Indiana, our sort of home regiment, uh, was actually a backup unit. They did get into the battle, but they were not one of the first units into the battle. Um, and then, of course, the, the main fame for the 19th Indiana came at Gettysburg. Uh, if you've all seen the movie Gettysburg, which is a pretty good movie, if you haven't read the book that it's based on, though, The Killer Angels, it's way better than the movie. And the movie wasn't bad. Uh, but anyhow, on the first day, the 19th Indiana was involved in the trying to repel the troops, which, and Gettysburg is an interesting battle because the southern troops came in from the northwest and the, and the Union Army came in from the southeast. It, it, every, everything was flip-flop because of the, where they'd been um, uh, riding and, and locating themselves before the battle started. But anyhow, the 19th and the entire Iron Brigade was involved in holding off the Confederate Army that was coming in uh, from the Northwest, and this is their monument on the battlefield at Gettysburg. Uh, it's one of the first things, if you take the daily, if you take the tour, it's one of the first things that you're going to see right down below um, the Willoughby Run, right down below the statue of John Burns. If you know the story of John Burns, I won't get into that now, but this, and the McPherson Barn, this is down in the swale below that, and this is where they did their thing, and they lost a lot of men there that day. But they fought bravely and valiantly, as did everybody in the Iron Brigade, and they held off the Confederate Army to give the Union Army time to regroup after General John Reynolds was killed and went back. The, the, uh, uh, the Iron Brigade did stay in the war, but they were so decimated after this that they really never had any height. They, they were in ag and th By the way, I should also tell you there's lots of other Iron, I shouldn't say lost, but there are other units that were called the Iron Brigade. It was a pretty popular thing. There were Those phrases kept getting thrown around in the war. It's just like you're, everybody that had a battle is going to say at some point that the battlefield, when it was over, was so filled with dead bodies that you could walk from one side to the other without stepping on the ground. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I find that a little difficult to believe, but it's a good story anyway. Um, but that's pretty much it. That's the Iron Brigade was, uh, was uh, the 19th Indiana was part of a, of a very vaunted unit 
and I'm proud of it today, and I hope everybody else is. And one of the things that I want to say here before we leave now, this is, okay, there's, you knew there was going to be a commercial, all right? This is the commercial. First of all, I want to invite anyone who wants to come up and heft this thing. You'll see what it was like to carry this thing around. It is not light to carry it around every day, move it, you know, take care of it and everything. And if you like it a lot, it belongs to the Monroe County History Center. And if you want to go talk to Susan over there, we probably would be willing to sell it. We bought it a, a year ago for a thing that didn't happen, or not a year ago, a couple years ago, for a thing that didn't happen. We really don't need it now. It is a working thing. You can take it out, get black powder, and go, go for it. Anyhow, uh, I, will, I will let her tell you how much we're going to charge you for it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. He was a drummer. He was a drummer. Uh, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody earlier, and if you, I had some stuff running over here. One of the things that I found on YouTube was something that I didn't know before I got into this. Uh, you see a lot of these um, horns that these people had who... They didn't have the last bend in them when the man played the tuba or the, uh, what, what, what do they call it, the, not a saxophone, but the saxophone or something like that. The bell of the instrument went over their shoulder and pointed backwards. Well, the reason for that was because the band marched in front of their regiment. So number one, that was so their regiment could simply hear because that's who they were playing for. That's who they really liked. And number two was they were, the regiment was keeping time with the band. So hopefully it was a good band and they kept in step. Um, anything else? Thank you all very, very much. And like I said, come up here and march around with this thing for a couple hours and see what you think of it.